Heavenly Father, we are gathered in your presence to hear your holy word. Grant us your Holy Spirit, so that by the preaching of your word, we may be brought to repent of our sins, to believe in Jesus in life and in death, and to grow every day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll sing hymn 761. Almighty 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Continue with the intro, after which we'll speak the glory of God. Praise the Lord! Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good, and not evil, that you may live, 
And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read uh, verses 12 through 17 of Psalm 90 responsibly. So teach us to number our days. That we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. And for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants. And your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Our epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. Alleluia! Bear one another's burdens, and so will fulfill the law of Christ. Alleluia. <laughs> setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn in 708, which is the children's hymn this week.
Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, given the riches of eternal life through Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he will even make you sad. A young man came running up to Jesus, eager and earnest, and bowed down before him on his knees. This man had two great loves in life. Two things that brought him great joy. And by the time he left that day, Jesus had ruined both of them for him. Because he loved him. The man says to him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A question which makes no sense. One does not do anything to inherit something. But the question does reveal quite a bit about this man, as does the fact that he calls Jesus good. See, while the man respects Jesus, kneels before him, calls him teacher, he doesn't believe that Jesus is God. If he believed Jesus was God, he wouldn't be on his knees. He would be on his face on the ground. And if Jesus isn't God, then Jesus isn't good. For no one is good except God alone. Bev was an extremely self-righteous person. She went to church every day. She knew her Bible front to back, but... Her religion was to her just an excuse to feel self-righteous and judge everyone else. She was really mean, self-centered, obsessed with appearances and with getting her own way. In the same congregation as Bev, there was a mother whose son had just gotten out of jail. He had gone to jail because he had gotten drunk, fallen asleep at the wheel, and killed a young woman. One day, for various reasons, this mother says to Bev, I think this is something you've needed to hear for a long time. You are not a good person. God doesn't love you more than anyone else. To which Bev is fine with a cruel sneer, well, at least my son isn't a drunken killer. And the mom responded, God loves my son just as much as he loves you. Why does that make you so mad? The young man in our text is not nearly so far gone as most of the Pharisees were as Beth. But he absolutely needed to hear the same thing that Beth needed to hear. The same thing we all do. And that's what Jesus is doing. When Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That isn't about Jesus. It's about the man. It is Jesus turning this around on him and saying to him, in about as gentle a way as you can, you are not a good person. And he's saying the same thing to you. And you need to hear it, because here's the thing. We are desperate to believe that we are good. But Jesus loves you enough to tell you that you are not. See, it's almost like you and I have this evil conspiracy theorist in our hearts. That's kind of what our sinful nature is. You ever try talking to somebody who's really hung up on some bizarre idea? You know, like somebody who thinks the earth is flat. And you, you try to explain, maybe you show them some evidence. And no matter what you say, no matter what evidence there is, they are just not going to believe it. They'll just reinterpret anything to fit with what they think. That's a part of our sinful nature. We can all be like that sometimes. And we are all always like that in our sinful nature about one particular thing. And that is about our own righteousness. We are obsessed with the idea that we are good people and we will reinterpret anything to try to fit with that preconceived notion. We've got all kinds of tricks for it. But see, this young man in our text, he didn't even really have to use any tricks. It was easy for him to think this. All his life, the Pharisees had taught him that keeping the law was only an outward thing. Like, don't murder anyone. And you've kept the fifth commandment. 
Don't cheat on your wife and you've kept the six. Don't shoplift. Don't lie in court. Don't trick anyone into getting what's theirs and you've kept seven, eight, nine, and ten. Easy as pie. You know, there's a thing about that. Just outward keeping them law. It's a thing that you can do. You could go your whole life abiding by those rules in an outward way. Especially if you are well-to-do like this man. Especially if you've never had any particular need, sinfully speaking, to break them. And you know what's even better about this for that evil conspiracy theorist in our hearts and in this man's heart? Oh, what's even better about this is that even though you can keep these outwardly, especially if you're rich, there are always going to be people around you who haven't. And that means you get to judge them. That means you get to look down on them and compare yourself to them and feel all the more self-righteous and good about yourself. And boy, does our sinful nature love that. And that's why this man can respond to Jesus with a totally straight face and say about commandments 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, all these I have kept from my youth. But, did you notice? And this is really where this man is not so far gone as the rest of the Pharisees. He did come to Jesus asking him, what do I still lack? See, he senses that something is missing. It's like he thinks this has just been too easy. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe even just for a little bit. Like things are going really well for a while, and you're like, I'm just, I'm just crushing it, right? I've got this thing figured out. My work life balance. I'm doing a great job at work. I'm an awesome parent, or whatever it is. And I'm pretty, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, there are days when you definitely don't feel that way, but you probably have had days when you did. And when you find that's the case, I suggest you need to take a little bit of a closer look at the law. The truth is that you have not loved your neighbor. Yet, you've probably never murdered anyone. But you haven't helped in every bodily need. Maybe you haven't cheated on your spouse, but have you had lustful thoughts in your heart? Sure, you probably haven't lied in court. Maybe you probably have never even been in court. The Eighth Commandment is more than that. You've probably gossiped, made fun of people behind their back, and you've definitely always tried to come out on top, right? Get the best deal, the best price, the best outcome, the best portion for you. And why? Because you are not a good person, and neither am I. That's what Jesus is saying here. You have not loved your neighbor as yourself, and you have not loved God. And that brings up something odd. Did you notice? Jesus pointed this man to the law, but he skipped the first three commandments. The ones that have to do with loving God. He told the man, go love your neighbor. He didn't say anything about God. Oh, it's because he's saving. Now, when the man said, yeah, I've kept all these. Jesus says to him, okay, one thing you're lacking. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then, come on, to follow me. This is the same deal that he offered his disciples. He told them to leave everything and follow him. And then in the case of uh, Peter and John, they, they literally, Peter and James and John and Andrew, they, they left their dad in a boat with the nets and came after him. They followed because that miraculous, powerful word that Jesus spoke to them, well, it worked faith in their hearts so that they believed that it was better to follow him and to be with him than anything else on earth. This man does not do that. He does not follow Jesus. It says he goes away disheartened, his face gloomy and downcast, like the way the sky looks when it's about to storm. He goes away sad, it says, because he has great possessions. Wait, what? He is sad because he has great possessions? I thought money was supposed to make you happy. Wait. I thought that the reason he didn't follow Jesus just now was because he didn't want to sell everything he had because he liked it so much. Why does it now make him sad? Do you see what Jesus has done? I told you that this man came to Jesus with two great loves and joys in this earth. One was his riches, the other was his righteousness. 
He loved his wealth, and he loved the idea that he was a good person. But what Jesus has done by giving him this specific and personal command is to reveal to him exactly what sort of sinner he is. This man can no longer hold on both to his wealth and to the idea that he is a good person. They are now self-contradictory. He has received a specific personal command to love God more than his money. And he does not. God has told him to sell everything in order to help his poor neighbors, and he will not. And he knows it. Which means that ever after, those riches are unrighteous to him. They are a constant testimony, taunting and tormenting, saying to him, you're not a good person. Every cent spent damns him. And that is exactly why Jesus said this to him. To make him sad. What about you? You might not be as wealthy as this man, although in terms of you know, comfort and ease of life, you're way ahead of him. And wealth itself may not be your idol, although at least at times it probably is one of them. But there is always at least something, isn't there? There is always something that, you're, that you by nature love more than God, that you don't want to give up for him. And then there is your own righteousness, that universal idol, which by nature we all love more than God. If you've ever looked down at the poor or reproachfully at the rich, well, you've got an idol. If, when you feel healthy and wealthy and wise, you think that this just confirms what a good person you are, this makes you feel righteous. You've got an idol. After all, you think, well, look how much I'm giving to the church. And look at what a wholesome and, you know, family kind of godly life I lead, especially compared to those people who have dug themselves such pits of homelessness and hopelessness and despair and drug addiction. I mean, and look at that. They live, in, they live in sin. They live in prostitution and in addiction. And they lie and they cheat and they steal and they're bad parents. And I've never done anything like that. I never would. It must be, our sinful nature thinks, that I have what I have because I'm righteous. It must be that I deserve it. Oh, we could turn this around now. If you're ever poor, or if you're just thinking about people who have more than you, we quickly reinterpret that data to fit our idea of self-righteousness too. Like, look at those. Look at those stingy, self-righteous jerks. They think they're so much better than me because they have more than me. It's not even fair. Why do they have more than I do? They, they don't work as hard as I do. They probably never really worked a day in their life. They probably got it like cheating and fine. And, and, or somebody just gave it to them. I don't think they deserve it. They've got, they've got a big fall coming. We love to think this way because it feeds our self-righteousness. See, at bottom, whether rich or poor, you and I are sinners who love our riches and our righteousness more than God. But... Your riches and your righteousness will rust and rot to ruin. And whatever other idols you may have, they will become a perpetually pointing finger of the law, reminding you, you're not a good person. You're not righteous. You do not love God. And you do not love your neighbor. Jesus loves you this much. That through his law, he seeks to show you this, to make you sad, to turn all your idols into things that will no longer bring you joy, but sadness. See, even though you may not be a good person, Jesus can work in you a good and godly grief, a grief that leads to repentance, as St. Paul says, that grief which shows you that you are not good, that you are not enough, that you are not okay, you are not righteous but that he is. See, Jesus doesn't just want to make you sad. He isn't trying to make you sad just to make you sad, but in order to give you the hope and joy of faith in him to give you his own goodness. And imagine someone came to your door, knock on your door, and they the door. And they ask you, oh, can I ask you? Are you satisfied 
with your cell phone or your computer or your car or your house. And you immediately think, oh, this is a salesperson. They want me to buy something. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm perfectly fine. But then what if they showed you something better? What if they showed you all the ways that your phone or car or house were deficient, that they were old and clunky and broken and lame, and they showed you something that was better by far? What if they made you so dissatisfied with what you had because of what they were offering that was so much better? And then what if they gave it to you free? That's what Jesus is doing. For what he offers this man is free. He offered him two things. He said, you'll have treasure in heaven. And he said, come and follow me. He has graciously invited him. It's sort of like he's saying, come on. And come with me. You can be with me. The man has asked what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus is saying, come on and see what I, what I will do. So that you might inherit life. Come see what I will give so that you might be free. Come see what I will suffer so that you might be saved. Come see how poor I will become so that you might have riches of heaven. Come see how low I will go that you might be exalted and how wretched I that you might become righteous. See how I will be hated so you will be loved. Come and see my sorrows to give you joy. Come and see my abandonment to give you the adoption as sons. Come see my blood that you might be clean and that your sins might be forgiven. Come see my cross and my death and my grave that you might have life. Come give up everything. Give up your righteousness because mine is better. And it is yours freely. Come, leave behind your riches, your idols, your earthly joys and pleasures. i got something greater. Treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And what Jesus is saying to you is, I am your treasure. I am your heart. I am your love and your joy and your riches and your righteousness. He loves you enough to make you sad for a little while that he might make you glad forever. He loves you enough to make you despair of your own works so that you might trust alone in his. He loves you enough to proclaim the law to you that he might give you the glad news of the gospel of the forgiveness of sins in his name. He loves you enough to tell you that you're not a good person so that you might believe in the one alone who is in Jesus Christ, both God and man, and from him alone receive all that is good. Nothing can compare to this. No works of man can compare to Jesus' works for man. No treasure on earth is anything compared to his golden story. The light of his love makes all light and love on earth seem like darkness by comparison, and so nothing also could compare to the treasure that he promises you. Nothing compares to the untold rolling ages of beauty and bliss that he will usher in when he comes again. To the inheritance of the saints in the light of his glory. To the fragrance of his name. Where joys bloom eternal in the sunlight of his splendor. Where all that is good endures. Where there will be sweet with no bitter and flowers that bear no thorn. Where they will be only good and all good forever. What can compare to that? What can compare to him? What can compare to his love? Yes. Jesus loves you enough that sometimes he makes you sad. But what is more? He loves you enough and his love is enough to make you glad forever in heaven's endless Day. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. We'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing in 753. church on earth. 
that the gospel of salvation, which you proclaim through imperfect people like us, through evil people even like us, might go out through all the world and bring many to believe in you, that they might share in that inheritance of the saints in life. We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon all of those who are hurting, who are sick, or sad, or weary, or guilty, or troubled, or depressed. Give to all of them that joy which alone comes through the goodness and mercy of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And grant, if it is your will, healing to all those who are hurting in their bodies. We ask especially for our brother Don Bickham and for Kaylee Ewing. That in Don's case, he would uh, grant the doctor's understanding of his situation and healing in his body, and especially, as you have promised, continued faith in his heart. And in Kaylee's case, that you would continue to grant her further strength as she grows and to regain some of what was lost in her sickness. We ask, Lord, that you would bless each one of us with the joy of your gospel and the boldness to share it with others. And that you would bless all those among us who are not able to be with us here today, especially Lori Longwitz and Carol Gilbertson, John and Deanna Hersberg. We ask all these things, confident that you will hear us and answer through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we also arise. I'm going to pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude with our final hymn in 557. Yeah.
with you and sharing the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ our Savior. Do announcements that you might playing Sunday school Bible class here shortly. Council meeting Wednesday at 6.30. Midweek service at Tuesday. As I mentioned last week, that's the repeat of, of today's service sermon-wise. It's a little short and it's got a little bit of energy, but the sermon is the same. And then, uh, as I mentioned in, in an email I sent out this week, I did receive a call to our sister church in Tacoma, Washington. So I appreciate you know your prayers as I consider that call and the one that I have here and any thoughts that you might have to share. Uh, any other announcements? All right. Let's have our Lord Jesus be with you.